X-Men The Animated Series is back and with a new coat of paint. Now called X-Men 97, the series continues the story of the X-Men after the events of X-Men The Animated Series, complete with its 90s aesthetic. So it's about time we cover this with 107 facts about X-Men 97. We'll cover conceptualization, development, and talk about some cool things found in the first four episodes of the show. Let's get started. Number one, X-Men 97 is the first X-Men project that Disney has done ever since regaining the rights from Fox. Number two, X-Men 97 was first announced in 2021 alongside other animated projects for Disney Plus, such as Spider-Man Freshman Year, which is now named Your Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, and Marvel Zombies. Number three, the series was being conceptualized as early as 2019. In an interview with Marvel head of streaming television animation, Brad Winderbaum, it was mentioned that after What If was greenlit, the team started to discuss what to do next. The first idea that they had was a revival of the original X-Men the Animated Series, of which Winderbaum was already a fan. Number four, in 2020, Bo DeMeo, a writer for Moon Knight, another Disney Plus series, amongst other things, was tapped to develop a pitch for X-Men 97. Number five, X-Men 97 serves as a sequel series to the original X-Men the Animated Series, not a remake, and takes place a year after the events of the original series. Number six, since the series continues the storyline of the original, it doesn't take place within the sacred timeline of the MCU. This was later confirmed by DeMeo with him saying that we are our own thing, and Winderbaum specifying even though X-Men 97 isn't in the sacred timeline, there is a universe of 90s cartoons that we know. I wonder if he's hinting at the fact that there is a Marvel animated universe, you know? Number seven, but does that mean it'll never be mentioned in the MCU? Well, Winderbaum mentioned that because of Loki and every other multiverse story, we know that if your brain wants to go there, you know that there's always potential for connections. And I'll admit my brain is definitely going there, especially considering that the multiverse idea means that everything is possible. Number eight, X-Men 97 takes place within the reality of Earth 92131, the same as X-Men X-Men the Animated Series, and Spider-Man the Animated Series. Number nine, the production team were committed to being faithful to the original series. The directors and writers of the original series were invited to give insight of the production while working on the original series. Number 10, animation for X-Men 97 is done by Studio Mir, a South Korean based studio who you might recognize as the ones behind the animation for The Legend of Korra, Voltron, Legendary Defender, and a short for Star Wars Visions. Season two, specifically. Number 11, according to Winderbaum, because technology's on a hyperbolic curve and we could do whatever we want and we can't listen to that siren's call, we have to stay the course, which meant arcing ourselves back into flat plane storytelling at times into locked off backgrounds. The soft kind of curves of the character designs, the big bold colors from that style of the 90s. He's obviously talking about the aesthetic of X-Men 97. Number 12, although many voice actors in the original cast make their return, due to certain circumstances, changes have been made to the voice cast for X-Men 97. Let's take a look at what the cast currently looks like. Looking at one of the first X-Men, we have Cyclops. Due to the passing of the late Norm Spencer, Ray Chase takes up the mantle as Cyclops. Ray Chase has been in the industry for a few years now, voicing Noctis from Final Fantasy XV, Bruno Bucciarati from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and Sukuna from Jujutsu Kaisen. I don't know if you could tell based off the credits that I just said, but I'm a big anime and video game fan. Another of the original X-Men, there's Jean Grey. Jean in 97 is voiced by Jennifer Hale, who takes over the role from Katherine Disher. Hale has been a voice actor for as long as I remember and has voiced Naomi Hunter in the Metal Gear Solid series, Black Hat in Spider-Man the Animated Series, and even Jean Grey in Wolverine and the X-Men. Number 15, while Katherine Disher didn't reprise her role as Jean Grey, she now plays Val Cooper. This is a trend that will continue with some of the other role replacements with a wide range of reasons for switching up the cast. Number 16, our first returning voice actor is Cal Dodd, who voices Wolverine. Dodd's voiced Wolverine in several video games in the 90s and even in his cameo appearance in Spider-Man the Animated Series. Next, we have Alliston Seely Smith, who returns as the voice of Storm. Smith actually replaced Iona Morris in the original series starting from season two of the show. Lenora Zan also makes her return in X-Men 97 as the voice of Rogue. Similar to Dodd, Zans played Rogue in Spider-Man the Animated Series and in 90s Marvel video games featuring Rogue. When she wasn't playing Rogue, Zan was doing her part as a politician in Canada. George Buza, or Buza, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, reprises his role as Beast in 97. Between the original series and 97, Buza's even made an appearance in the live-action X-Men film from the year 2000, playing a trucker, and has played Beast in 2001's X-Men Mutant Academy 2 video game. Switching back to the new faces, we have J.P. Karliak, voicing the character Morph. 
Karliak replaces Ron Rubin, who originally voiced Morph. Rubin instead plays the character of President Robert Kelly, who was originally voiced by the late Len Carlson. Jubilee is now voiced by Holly Chow, replacing Allison Court. Chow has credits in shows such as Blue Eye Samurai and video games such as Like a Dragon Gaiden, The Man Who Erased His Name, and more. Number 23. Jubilee's voice change is in part due to trying to have a more authentic representation, with Court recognizing that her playing an Asian character as a Canadian voice actor was a product of the 90s. Number 24. Like Ruben, Court will see herself in a new role as the character Absissa, which is a variant of Jubilee. Number 25. Gambit also sees a recast with AJ Locascio taking over for Chris Potter. Locascio has credits in video games, film, and animation, playing characters in The Loud House, Voltron, Legendary Defender, and several Star Wars projects. Chris Potter instead will play the character of Cable, the son of Scott and Jean Grey, and in turn replaces Lawrence Bain, the original voice of Cable. This was due in part to DeMeo believing that their voices would better represent the strained relationship between Cable and his father Scott, or Cyclops. Number 27. Lawrence Bain instead plays Executioner, the leader of the Friends of Humanity, an antagonistic group to the X-Men. Number 28. Winding down the list, we have Bishop, who is now played by Isaac Robinson Smith, replacing Philip Aiken. Robinson Smith provided his voice in another Marvel anime project, What If, and also has credits in animation and video games. Lastly, we have Magneto, with Matthew Watterson replacing the late David Hemlin. Watterson is credited in several video games, animations, and more, from Star Wars to Doom, Batman to X-Men, and so, so much more. Number 30. While much of the original cast reprised their roles, it didn't mean that they had a free pass to their characters. Dodd and Zan, the voices of Wolverine and Rogue, mentioned in a roundtable interview that they had to audition for their characters just like the newcomers. Number 31. Speaking to Radio Times, X-Men 96 director producer Jake Castorena believed that they had to bring back the legacy cast, but understood that it had been 30 years, so some of that cast was either no longer here or voices just changed. Number 32. One of the struggles newcomers had was voice match, while also trying to act. Chow, Jubilee's new voice, said that she didn't just want to match Allison Court's performance, even if the audition was to try sounding like her character. Number 33. The producers of the show even said that, quote, We realized that we went for the voice match, but we hired really good actors for this, so why don't we sort of free them of that obligation to try to evoke the previous voices? Number 34. The production team believed that the original designs for the characters also needed to be updated. According to director Jake Casarena, they needed to update designs to stay relevant, stating, it needs to be the show we remember, but it has to be in 4K. Because the reality is, we've learned so much just in the art form of TV animation itself, from what works, what doesn't work, technical advancements, production advancements, artistic advancements. Number 35. Creative liberty was taken for Cyclops, whose eyes are are often covered completely by his visor or glasses. Because there was no eye contact with the audience, the team had to change up the way his visor or glasses glint to form expressions. Number 36, the lead character designer, Amelia Vidal, mentioned that for the revival, they wanted to bring in body diversity. They stated that Jean, Rogue, Storm, and Jubilee all have different body proportions, heights, age, physical builds, and posture attitudes. Number 37, looking closely at each character, we see some additional detail and changes. Jubilee's earrings, for example, now say Jubilee, just like her original comic book counterpart. Number 38. Storm now sports a mohawk, reflecting her hairstyle change in Uncanny X-Men number 173. Number 39. Morph has one of the biggest changes. DeMeo and the team wanted to depict Morph as someone who identifies as non-binary. Morph now has a blank face and eyes and no hair. Number 40. However, because of DeMeo's statement, there has been some backlash among a sector of the community. Karliak, Morph's voice actor, had to clarify a few things. Two things about that. One, as far as I know, we're never going to say the word non-binary, because nobody said the word non-binary in the 90s. It's not that it didn't exist, it was just in no way a mainstream term at the time. Karliak also pointed out that Morph's understanding of who he is could equate to what a modern person would say is non-binary, but he just doesn't have the terminology for it. At the same time, they them wasn't a concept in terms of using it as a pronoun. Number 41. DeMeo also mentioned that there will be a characterization change with Morph. In his words, less doom and gloom. Number 42. Moving on to the music, the music in X-Men 97 is composed by the Newton Brothers. You may have recognized the name if you're fans of Mike Flanagan's work, such as The Haunting of Hill House and Midnight Mass, or a fan of the Five Nights at Freddy's film. I need to know. Comment down below if you saw the Five Nights at Freddy's film. Double comment if you want us to do a 107 on it. Number 43. While the Newton Brothers are the composers of the show, X-Men 97 still uses the good old X-Men the Animated Series intro music. It just makes sense, you know? Number 44. Finally. 
X-Men 97 launched on Disney Plus on March 20th, 2024. Number 45. The X-Men 97 intro sequence borrows a lot from the original series' intro, albeit with a few changes. The most obvious is that, well, it's widescreen now. Number 46. Next, when looking into the Blackbird's cockpit, you'll notice that they've added Beast, Morph, and Bishop. Number 47. Character appearances in the intro have also changed and shifted, with Jean Grey's character card appearing second and Morph and Bishop being added. Number 48. Also, a small little change in Wolverine's character card, he starts off in his underwear now. Number 49. The intro sequence also updates Rogue's scene of her flipping the Sentinel. This time around, they use a version adapted from an old storyboard that was for the original's intro sequence, however, had to be changed in the final version. Number 50. The intro sequence's final clash scene has also been updated. Instead of Magneto's side featuring Juggernaut, Warpath, Yuri Topolov, Pyro, Mystique, Sabretooth, and Avalanche, we see Magneto's side include Juggernaut, Emma Frost, Lady Deathstrike, Pyro, Mystique, Sabretooth, and Avalanche. Number 51. The civilian part of the scene has also been updated, featuring a more diverse cast of characters running away from two sentinels in the background, which weren't there before. Number 52. Lastly, on the hero side, Jean Grey joins the fray instead of featuring only Cyclops, Wolverine, Rogue, Gambit, Storm, Jubilee, and Professor X. Number 53. Every opening sequence features scenes from the original series, updated and redrawn to match the style of 97. Comment down below with some of the scenes you spotted. Number 54. Instead of Scott narrating the previously on segments of every episode, like he did on X-Men the Animated Series, other characters get the spotlight, and these characters tend to be the ones that hold importance to the episode itself. And that's that for this half of 107 Facts about X-Men 97. If you want to watch the rest, head over to our sister channel, Stan Lee Presents. And remember, Frederator loves you.